Hello. Hi, everyone. My name's Anne, and I'd like to um, thank the healthcare consumers, C and Darcy, for including advanced care planning in the Dying to Know presentation today. Um, my, I, my role is a program officer with advanced care planning, which is located within Canberra Health Services, but our role is territory wide. And the program not only provides education sessions to promote the uptake and awareness of advanced care planning like this one, but we also offer free support and answer questions or concerns and assist with completing documents if needed. So my background is in nursing also, um, and my passion for advanced care planning comes from my wholehearted belief in person-centred care. Um, before we begin, um, advanced planning uh, is a bit of a delicate subject, but we've already hit that bit, we hit that today and probably this week. Um, and it's a situation where, where we're in when we can't make our own decisions. So that is confronting and it is a difficult concept to navigate. So I always offer the choice of leaving the room with no judgment when I'm doing a presentation, but you're over, if you're overwhelmed, but the same applies to leaving the Zoom if it becomes overwhelming. And I really do promise to keep it kind um, and light. So what I'm hoping today is that you'll enjoy this gentle introduction to advanced care planning and that you understand that advanced care planning is a valuable addition to life planning in general and maybe feel empowered to find out a little bit more and start thinking about your own advanced care plan. I've had a little slide change here. So what is advanced care planning? It's not just documents, it's a process. It allows you first of all to appoint a nominated substitute decision maker to be your voice and make choices about healthcare treatments on your behalf. So it's really um, a process and it takes a bit of time. It's not so easy. So why do I need advanced care planning? Well, none of us know what lies ahead. 50% of people are unable to make their own healthcare choices towards the end of life. And unfortunately, death statistics are holding pretty steady at 100%. Uh, we know that accident, injury and health crisis unfortunately happen. So advanced care planning can be a really effective tool it can support the people important to you to voice your choices and can allow you to control the circumstances around care and treatment. And it can make a good end of life possible. It also can allow you to live the way that you want to live. We've also got to keep in mind that dementia is, is now a leading cause of death in women and not far behind in men. And you know, there are some things that we, we can control um, and others that we can't. So planning for future health care has some really significant challenges, but advanced care planning can hold hope and opportunity. The hope isn't a plan, but planning will generate hope. So we've got to think about it that the person, if ever they're making decisions for you, will often be stressed. And it's not a really easy thing to do to make decisions on behalf of someone in a crisis situation. And by providing some guidance in advance, you can assist them to make decisions and be able to clearly voice your choices. Keep your care the way you want it to be, exactly the way you want it to be. So planning ahead becomes reassuring for you and for those honouring your wishes and your life. And that hope, that we've hoped for can be achieved when everything turns out as it's planned. Now, I do have to scroll back because one of my slides has disappeared in the wrong order. So I'm heading back here a little bit. Sorry, everyone. Um, there are challenges and Alicia really did in the LGBTQIA plus community. And Alicia did a really good job of outlining a lot of those challenges, but LGBTI consumers often delay access to care and planning and it does lead to poorer outcomes. And I have to add that that's a common theme in all population groups. Delaying future health care planning is a thing because the fears and concerns and stress that um, affect all of us are very real. But the LGBTQI population have additional fears and they're very real and very impactful. ACON did a fantastic response to the Advanced Care Planning National Framework and outlined the challenges and concerns of communities 
specific to advanced care planning. And a lot of it was to do with aged care and palliative services not being able to be inclusive. Uh, a lot of it was that fear of anticipatory discrimination, repetitious disclosure and reduced care outcomes and ignorance and bias. But, you know, it results in people hiding their sexuality and subsequent poorer health outcomes. And there's this real lack of understanding of family structures and that exposes people to the risk of having their wishes ignored. So there's lack of guidance on how to best uphold pe people's choices when conflicts arise between their biological family and their partner of choice. And there's so many complexities with physical and care needs as well. So there's a lot of stuff there and Alicia did outline that. And I certainly have personally seen the impact of these challenges in the healthcare system. I've um, been asked to see a same gender couple who needed assistance to do an enduring power of attorney but it was hours before surgery um, for one of them with brain cancer. And they were very stressed that an eventual lack of capacity may allow the next of kin decision-making authority over the partner of several years. I've also been to a, um, a gay man who was very clearly at the end of life, but was insisting on life support, which was incomprehensible from the treatment perspective, but he needed the opportunity to say what was important to him at the end of life. And he couldn't say that to anyone, but when he said it to me, we were able to make sure all of those things happened for that person. And often I get people that are referred um, and we have a lot of people with um, aging with HIV complexities. And sometimes they're referred for advanced care planning from their practitioners and they're very reluctant to, ga to engage. And sometimes that's way too late. And sometimes it's, it's, you know, it's always too soon until it's too late. Always too soon until it's always too late. So I'm just gonna flip back to where I was. Sorry, that slide was meant to go there. I love my little hope. But there's, as many of us, we've got the opportunities. As, as long as we've got the challenges, we also have the opportunities with an advanced care plan. So we can make sure that our choices for treatment, our place of care and appropriate care requirements and um, for medications, physical needs are really spelt out and are really clear for people to know. And it's actually a very hard thing to do. And Alicia uh, said that before, but if we can start working towards making sure that that's known, it's certainly comforting. Making sure that we include the right people, the important people, the family, chosen family, that gender expression and cultural preferences are really clear. So this is a way, advanced care planning is a way where you can plan for equitable, respectful, safe, quality and inclusive care and get the dignity and respect that's deserved. And I have to go there to that cartoon on the slide um, with my most famous philosopher of all times, Snoopy and Charlie Brown. You know, someday we're all gonna die, Snoopy, but, but Snoopy's very clear, true, but on other days we will not. So advanced care planning is very much making sure you live that the way that you want to live. And we're only gonna die on one day. So we need to live as well as we can for as long as we can. And it's so important. It's called advanced care planning for a reason. So we can prepare well in advance. So you can take your time to reflect and discuss and plan and record and share your thoughts. And if circumstances change, you can change your plans. What's really important is making sure that you've got someone legally appointed to be your decision maker. So I'll go on a little bit to the documents and the advanced care planning steps that are used in the ACT. And it is different in New South Wales, but I'll um, discuss ACT here. And there will be a session later on where I'll, I'll go into New South Wales documents a little bit further. The reason I've got a cake there is because I talk about the advanced care planning documents in cake. It's a bit like a universal language. I'm sure we'll all agree to that. Um, having, first of all, the first document that you must have is have someone to speak for you. So appointing an enduring power of attorney. So that's a bit like a basic cake that comes out of the oven. It smells good, tastes good, it does the job. It feeds people, it does what it's meant to do. If you've got someone legally appointed to speak for you, and hopefully they know what you want, that's your cake. That's the basis of advanced care planning. And you can dress that cake up a little bit with a few other documents. So we have a document called the Statement of Choices. And that is where your values and wishes, your choices for life prolonging treatment, about what's important to you, 
about your choices for end of life care, you can spell anything out in that statement of choices. It's your values and wishes and a directive. So that's your icing on the cake. Now, if there's something that you are completely refusing, something that you do not want to have, you can complete a health direction. And we know that that's different from every state and territory because we have a legal document that's called a health direction where someone can legally refuse care. That's your big sparkler on the cake. So that's, I refuse the following sorts of medical treatments. So it's legally um, completed and legally should be respected. So they're your three documents that you can fill in. Not everyone will have all three documents. Some people will just have the power of attorney and that's absolutely fine. They've chosen someone to speak for them and they can have conversations with that person to represent their wishes. But there's nothing sure that if you want a plan followed, write it down, make sure it's clear. And then you can put the health direction in if there's something you're absolutely clear about refusing or having withdrawn from your care and treatment. The other option we do say is to share your documents. So that's just sh that's sharing them with the people that are gonna make decisions, but there also are options to lodge the documents at Canberra and Calvary hospitals or upload to my health record. But that again is a very um, confronting thing to do to put your documents out there. So we do say, and, and one of the recommended recommendations from ACON was that we should have culturally sensitive ACP storage options, ensuring that that data is readily accessible, but private and sensitive information such as trans experience and health needs and care relationships aren't really publicly available till needed. So you can have that option of just making sure it's with your decision makers to break the glass and to use it if it's needed. Um, the Advanced Care Planning Program and ACT Health have recently re, uh, released a, doc a document called Advanced Care Planning in the ACT that does have a couple of sections. It has a statement of choices form at the end, but it also has frequently asked questions and tips to complete. And that's a really good start um, to think about advanced care planning, to think about um, your wishes. And if you'd like a copy of that, we're happy to post a copy or it is available on the um, ACT Health and the Canberra Health Services website to download. So, it's really quite difficult to plan for the unknown about what's going to happen to you in your future healthcare. So when you talk about, when we talk about advanced care planning, we talk about what matters to a person, not what's the matter with that person. And we talk about what's important for a person to live well. And in that same space, we're sort of thinking about what would be the worst thing so that those values and wishes can guide the person making decisions for you. So I'll just share a few other people's words with you. Um, I want to be as independent as I can be, be able to make my own decisions about care and treatment, communicate responsibly and eat and drink naturally. I have to go to a care facility. I want it to be one that will let me express my gender identity and see my partner without judgment. I want to be able to participate in life and all its joys. It's important that gender affirming medications and lifestyle continue. Keep me comfortable, manage pain and symptoms of distress and maintain my dignity. And of course, this comes up a bit, get that whisker off my chin, keep my teeth in and make sure my pyjamas match. I have to share with you a lovely statement from the uh, Alberta Hearth Services, and this is Maxine's advanced care plan. Again, I'm keeping it light. Maxine, being of sound mind and body, do not wish to be kept alive indefinitely by artificial means. If a reasonable amount of time passes and I fail to ask for at least one of the following, a glass of wine, chocolate, margarita, champagne, cold beer, chocolate, KFC, Tim Tams, Macca, Maccas, hot chips, chocolate, pizza, ice cream or a cup of tea, presumed I won't ever get better. But when such a determination is reached, I hereby instruct my person responsible and medical staff to pull the plug, reel in the tubes and call it a day. I'd love to meet Maxine. Okay, there's a lot of information out there on the web. And of course, um, with the, res the Respect My Decisions, It's My Right Kit, Safeguarding at the End of the Rainbow, Advanced Care Planning Australia.org, our own Advanced Care Planning uh, site. So there's certainly a lot of information. Um, the Advanced Care Planning Program uh, at Canberra Health Service are very happy to meet and discuss with you without any obligation of feeding, of completing documents. Um, just having a chat, providing any information that you would like. 
Um, does anyone have any questions for me? Feel free to pop questions in the chat if you have any. Um, we do have some here for you, Anne. So we've got, um, if I don't want certain people to be involved in my care, e.g. my biological family, can I specify that? So we're going back to kind of what Alicia was talking about before with disclosure of information. Yeah. Yeah. Look, look you, you can, can definitely... definitely make sure that those people are excluded um, and that but the most important way to do that was to make sure that you do have a legally appointed decision maker and that is the person that you choose. Um, sometimes you do need to make it clear I guess uh, when going into hospitals having it in um, in the admission process is probably a really good idea but as an individual in a hospital situation with capacity, you should be the person that is spoken to first and it should be very clear who else that information with privacy laws is shared with. And if you've lost capacity, then it's very important that you have a legally appointed decision maker that is the point of call for, um, for people, for decisions, for information sharing. So, and, and the ACT, the Enduring Power of Attorney is quite a simple process to do. You don't actually need to go to a lawyer to do it. And our program can assist with that as well. Thanks, Anne. Um, we also have another one. What can someone do if they see their loved one's advanced care planning isn't being followed? definitely um, speak up. I'm a great one for being an advocate and making sure that that advanced care plan, and again, it's the enduring power of attorney that has that power to speak for that person. So it's just being that advocate and um, being very um, brave to stand up to health professionals and protect that person's rights. There are also, um, you know, there's certainly complaint processes and all those sorts of things and advocates out there in the community. But I think the most important thing is to stand up and to be very clear to the providers that what's important to this person and make sure that, that those documents are shared and that the person's wishes are followed. Thanks, Anne. Do we have any more questions? Um, if not, we might wrap it up there. Um, and I do have one coming through. Um, so what are the services that are available for multicultural communities in the ACT? Did I remute myself? <laughs> so look, multicultural advanced care planning is, um, is a difficult process. And I know healthcare consumers have been doing a lot of work in the past to make sure that these uh, minority groups have the information about advanced care planning. Um, and that continues um, uh, with, with other organisations. Um, I find that, um, when I do an advanced care plan with someone from a different background, that I have to keep that level of sensitivity uh, involved and use an interpreter if necessary and make sure that that person has those com comfortable um, surrounds and family supports when, um, when, I'm doing that with a, when I'm doing advanced care planning with someone from a different culturally or diverse background. So I feel like um, it's, it's interesting that there's not a great deal of uptake because there is a lot of cultural um, 
sometimes concerns about advanced care planning historically. So we have to tread very gently um, when introducing these concepts as well. Thank you, Anne. Um, I think we have another one. Um, Alicia, if you're still around, I'm just getting a message through, wondering if there are any multicultural issues or concerns in your line of work as well. Um, absolutely. I think um, th th there is a section in the toolkit that talks about intersections of different identities. And I think for um, people with different cultural backgrounds who are also LGBTQIA+, um, there's a lot of um, reconciliation, especially with cultural practices and religion, especially. Um, so a lot of people have their own ways that um, they've reconciled those things. So it's it's really important to um, acknowledge how, which, which we do with everybody, acknowledge how each individual interacts with their culture and religion. Um, but that can be especially, you know, a big thing. Also, I, I think um, First Nations people, it's worth um, us really thinking about how we engage in advanced care processes um, and end of life processes with those people. And um, as I say, the added intersection of being LGBTQIA plus also adds complexity there. Um, and big emphasis on community care, which is important for a lot of people that the whole community is cared for rather than just the individual. Thanks, Alicia. Alrighty. Well, we might finish there um, if there are no other questions. Thank you very much to Alicia and Anne. They were really great presentations um, and I'm sure we've all learned a bit today. Um, so yeah, just last call for any extra questions. Otherwise we'll finish up for today. Um, and I just wanted to kind of put it to Alicia or Anne, is there anything you'd like to add on to the conversations we've had today? Look, I'd like to say, start thinking about making sure you've got an advanced care plan in place. Make sure you start off with getting that legally appointed substitute decision maker and use the advanced care planning process to guide conversations to make sure. And look, you know, this is an insurance policy. It may never happen but it's lovely to have that in the background. If you ever lost capacity, that your wishes would be followed and you would remain a person in the centre of care. I think it's really important. Mm 